right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, thank you for joining the, uh, this behavioral science talk uh, series. Uh, I'm Alki Leopoulou. Uh, I want to welcome you all on behalf of the Harvard uh, Kennedy School Alumni Association here in, uh, in New England and um, say hello to our friends from the Harvard Club of Merrimack and their friends in North Shore. Uh, thanks everyone for, for being here. Thank you, Brian Hall, for, for joining us today and uh, uh, being willing to share your knowledge. Brian is an expert in uh, motivations and incentives, and um, he's a professor at the Harvard Business School, and he does experiments, uh, just like everyone else uh, here in these talks. So everything um, he's going to tell us is based on evidence that he has collected. Uh, so it's advice that could be very helpful for organizations and individuals. I'm a professor at the uh, uh, business school, and I'm happy to talk to you about behavioral science. Uh, and I'm working on a book, and so I'm going to talk about a bunch of studies that I reference or discuss in the book. The book is a bit of a how-to book, how to build an incentive plan within an organization, uh, but it's a behavioral economics uh, book. So if you think about the many behavioral economics books uh, that are out there, Dan Ariely, uh, Kahneman and Tversky, et cetera, there, there are a whole bunch of them. Uh, this is a book that's like that, but it's sort of built around a specific purpose. So with that in mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through and sort of talk about some of the highlights from the book and some of the, uh, and, and some of the, and some of the science that actually is behind uh, some of the thinking and some of the finding. Um, so let me actually start with uh, the straight economics. Uh, what is an incentive plan? Uh, and, and, and oh, just one other thing is I'm gonna try to go for 30 minutes and then we'll leave a whole bunch of time at the end for questions with a hard stop at one o'clock. So um, the name of the book is uh, that I'm working on, it's in progress, it's called Sense and Nonsense uh, how to build a winning incentive plan. And the, the sense and nonsense is because it's about sensible and nonsensible ways to use money and non-money uh, to motivate people within organizations. So let's start with just straightforward economics. This is what an incentive plan is. An incentive plan says, okay, somebody within the organization has the uh, authority to make decisions uh, now, how do we actually make them accountable for working hard, making wise decisions, making decisions that are in the uh, interests of the organization, et cetera? And that is through, we measure how they've done, performance measurement, and then we put on some accountability. There's some consequences. There's some rewards or punishments, typically a bonus plan. So in most cases, it looks something like this. It's a bonus, and then we say there's pay. Uh, mapped up against some measure of performance and it's upward sloping and that's 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 pay for performance. That to a first approximation is like the starting point for agency theory and the the the, the finance and, and organizational economics that's behind the building of incentive plans. That's where I started 25 years ago when I was teaching it and uh, and, and let me just talk a little bit more about the main problem in designing incentives when you have only the lens of economics. Um, so Victor uh, Vroom uh, put together something called expectancy theory in 1964, which was the year that I was born. And literally it just lays out, it's not particularly sophisticated psychology, but it's helpful. It lays out uh, the, the, the reasons why an incentive works. So people give effort, and then that effort leads to performance that translates into performance. And then when, it, when you get high performance, you get some sort of reward and it has to be a reward that you value. And if those conditions are met, then incentives lead to more, uh, 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 to, to greater performance. Now here's the, here's the main problem. The central problem when you just have the lens of economics is this, and that is there's a trade-off uh, if you're just looking at, at, at performance for individuals and organization, there's a, there's a, a really tough trade-off. You could use super broad measures. So say you work in a company, uh, you can have the stock price or company profits uh, as the measure. Uh, some companies do this. They'll, they'll just say, we don't want any individual incentive plans. I'm studying one right now. We just want high level uh, 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 measures for the whole company. 
Now notice when you do that, it's really aligned with what you're trying to achieve, right? You're trying to achieve company profits and stock price, but from any one person's point of view, it's not great line of sight. We call that low controllability. You can't, you know, unless you're the CEO and the very top people, you can't affect these measures very well. So what we tend to do is we tend to dig down into individual performance and try to see how individuals are actually performing. Now, the benefit of that is that that's highly controllable, right? Uh, so for example, uh, I have a case that I've taught for many years on a piece rate plan for uh, safe light auto glass installation. So it's installing windshields. So you go in and you just measure how many windshields did you put in? And they put in that plan and they put a piece rate on it, done at individual performance. So that was the incentive plan. Well, guess what? You get the very predictable outcome that once you measure individual performance at a very uh, granular level, uh, people can game the system. So they start doing them too fast and they started having a quality problem. And that's the completely predictable outcome from when you sort of drill down and you try to have high controllability, you tend to get less alignment and you, and you have to deal with that. Now, before you just say, oh, that's a minor problem, uh, it's caused some companies to go bankrupt or go near bankrupt. I'll, I'll give you an, uh, an example that's related to Safe Light. Sears uh, back in the 1960s, uh, I'm sorry, the 1980s, uh, put in a, a plan for their, uh, their automotive uh, 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 fix-it uh, places, where the, the, the service centers. And so they put in a, a, a piece rate plan so people would get more for more things that they, uh, that they fixed, getting everybody working very hard and focusing very well, great. But they also started inventing problems that didn't exist. Uh, 60 Minutes got wind of it, did an expose, sent 40 perfectly good cars uh, through the Sears system, something like 38 of them came back with problems that didn't exist. And so you can see, you know, that's, that's really bad alignment. Uh, but in, in general, you don't get actual fraud, but you, do, but you do have an alignment problem. Now, I'm not going to talk about this, but there is one solution. So this is, the, this is the central problem of designing incentives, and that is performance measurement. There are many other problems. I can write a whole book on it, or I, I will be writing like a third of a book on, ju on, on, on just this stuff. But that's the, that's the central problem. The solution to that, if you don't have anything else in your quiver, no other tools, is moving towards subjective performance uh, uh, evaluation, where you try to get the benefits of the, the, the narrow measures, uh, which are the strong incentives, but you try to get them better aligned, but then you need qualitative measures, like is the person a good team player? Are they honest? You know, things like that. It gets very, very messy. So it's a solution, but it's a very sort of messy solution. And again, not gonna get into that. What I would like to do is move over now and start talking about the behavioral uh, science. So who, if Adam Smith was the very first economist, who was the person who invented sort of behavioral science? Uh, Kahneman and Tversky uh, get uh, credit for uh, uh, inventing behavioral economics, but the first sort of managerial scholar who did it was a guy by the name of Frederick Taylor. What did Frederick Taylor do? So Frederick Taylor said, uh, and, and by the way, uh, he's both a villain and a hero. Peter Drucker says uh, that he's, you know, what he did around 1910 when he came in was more the most powerful as well as the most lasting contribution America's had since the Federalist Papers. So some people think that this is really, really, truly amazing stuff. Um, so here's what, here's what Taylor did. He had a scientific approach to business problems. Uh, this is around the 1910s. And he said, why should workers just go off and everybody figure out all their own stuff? Let's actually teach workers how to do it using science. So we'll break down a job, uh, say on an assembly line, into all the, all the motions that you have to go through. Let's time each motion and give the workers piece rate incentives. We figure out the best way to do it. And then now everybody is optimized on doing things exactly the right way. And you put on a piece rate. Uh, and so they're motivated to actually do it, uh, do it fast and well. And well, uh, you've, you've solved a problem. So this really was awesome in, in a few ways. One is it worked in lots of companies. 
uh, it became standard in, uh, in many, many factories. Taylor got invent, uh, invited to Japan and, and Europe and was giving talks. You know, there's a, his stopwatch uh, be, be, became famous, etc. cetera. So lots and lots of good things happened. But towards the end of his life, there was a backlash. Uh, the problem that Taylor was solving was that people were no longer what's called soldiering, which is pretending to work hard while making sure that you don't work too hard so that the standards don't rise. And so Taylor was, thought he was solving, uh, solving one problem, which, which he did, which is people, people uh, worked harder and better. But a new problem came, and that was that people said, uh, uh, I'm going to move to another, uh, another slide. Uh, the, there was such strong backlash that the Harvard Business School removed scientific management from its curriculum only six years after it was adopted. And here's the primary reason why. One machinist said, the system is wrong because we want our heads left on us. Taylorism was telling workers exactly what to do, exactly how to do it, treating them almost like robots. It became soulless, he became hated, and uh, to this day, his, his sort of uh, influence on behavioral science is uh, both wonderful and, and horrible at the same time. And that's because he got this one thing wrong of micromanaging people, telling them exactly what to do. So now, there's many studies that show that people actually care about the meaning of work. And that may sound like an obvious thing, but there are some cool studies that show it. So for example, one study uh, that was done by Dan Ariely uh, and, and a few others uh, was they had subjects come and build bionicles and they gave them a piece rate to do it. So the, for the first one, you got two. When does the subject quit? And of course it was random across conditions. There's a meaningful condition where the subjects built the bionicles, they were measured, they were set aside for the worker to see, and then they were rewarded. The second condition was almost uh, identical, except for when the subjects would build the bionicles, they'd be measured, but then they were taken apart, like as they went along. They just had somebody sitting there saying, okay, here's the next one. Uh, it was built, take it apart, and rewarded. Well, you could guess what happened in the in this second condition. By, by the way, they didn't, of course, tell the people in the in the study that one was a meaningful condition and one was a Sisyphus condition. Uh, that, that's for the scholars. But uh, you got exactly what you might have predicted, which is you got a lot more productivity from group A, who actually felt not only they were being rewarded, but actually what they were doing was meaningful, right? Where, where they get to see the, the, their, their creation. And anybody who has kids knows that that's a very important uh, 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 aspect of, of, of humans is that we like to build stuff and be proud of it. You come home from work and your kids, dad, dad, look what I built. Okay. That doesn't go away just because you become an adult. Uh, sort of obvious, but if you go back and you look at Taylorism and you look at just the straight economics, it doesn't take this into account at all. So what we need to do is we need a broader, better measure uh, of, of, of uh, what it is that people value. And so here's, uh, here's uh, 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 our best take on all the major factors of motivation. The extrinsic here, this is what Taylor was looking at, right? You work hard and you get paid. That's the sort of standard one. But people also in organizations, they care a lot about bonding with others. And we're going to have to take that into account. They also care a lot about the meaning. We just talked about that. And oh, by the way, they care a lot uh, about just the joy of work itself. Not all aspects of, of work are, are joyful. I don't always like preparing for lectures, but I'm certainly doing this now. I'm not getting a bonus. I'm not getting any extra pay for this. I'm doing this because I enjoy this and it's fun and interesting to me. Um, and hopefully it's fun and interesting to you, I, I, sh I should add. Um, and then there's uh, another aspect of motivation and that is the drive to defend, which is, comes right out of Kahneman and Tversky. It's sort of like loss aversion, that once you have something, you want to protect it. 
So having something and losing it is very different than never having it. Having it and losing it is far more painful. So there's a huge motivation for people to protect what they have. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. Now, I could talk about the ultimatum game, but I think I'm not going to have time. I could come back to that in the question and answer. But there's really, really good evidence that people care a lot about fairness. And when they think something's unfair, they're willing to often pay money in order to, uh, in order to get a fair outcome rather than uh, 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 what they view as an unfair outcome. That was something that 30 years ago, and this came from the ultimatum game, I don't want to take the time uh, because I don't want to use up all the questions uh, to, 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 to go through that, but it's super convincing evidence that uh, uh, people, care about, uh, people care about far more than, than just the money. In fact, we even have evidence that when they ran the ultimatum game and somebody gave, quote unquote, an unfair offer, uh, you could see parts of the brain light, light up that are around disgust, conflict, et cetera. People became angry. And when people become angry, they will spend money to create fairness, even if they're just punishing a complete strainer, stranger. On the other hand, when they're given a fair offer, notice what lights up in the brain. It's the planning part. It's the rational part. It's the part that, that I'm using right now to give this talk and that you're using right now to hopefully understand this talk. Bottom line, fairness is very hardwired into the human brain and matters a lot. And anytime you're talking about designing incentive systems and so forth, you have to understand that, that fairness is going to be a huge issue. When I first learned this stuff, I was taught by Mike Jensen, um, who's the king of agency theory. And he said, no, fairness isn't real. All fairness means is that you don't like something. Well, I don't think that's right. Fairness is hardwired into the human brain. And when you have comparators that make something look unfair called reference points, people think that fairness, uh, fair, it can lead to be angry, leads to demotivation, quitting, unethical behavior when people think that they've been, it's been unfair, cheating goes up, harming goes up, the unhappy list goes on and on. And so Fairness is, is really important. And, and again, going back to being a parent, um, every parent knows that one of the first, first words that uh, kids learn very, very early is that's not fair. They look and they see that their, their brother, their sister, their friend, somebody has something that they want. That's not fair. They very sort of quickly uh, latch onto this. Okay. Um, Here's just one sort of interesting uh, study that I'll just uh, 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 show that there are a million studies on, on, on fairness. But imagine that you receive a traffic ticket one day for failing to stop at a stop sign. You believe the ticket is unfair because your view of the stop sign was, was obstructed by branches from a large tree that should have been trimmed by the city. You go to court to protest the ticket because you think it was unfair. You spend hours practicing your testimony before your friends you finally get your day in court. And now imagine one of two things happens. In the first scenario, your ticket is dismissed without a hearing because the officer who gave you the ticket didn't appear in court that day. So you get your money back. You've achieved, you've achieved your objective. In the second scenario, the judge listens carefully, asks you a number of questions, compliments you on your photographs and diagrams, says he understands, uh, but then after carefully considering the facts, uh, rules against, she rules against you, arguing that the stop sign, though obstructed, was still visible. And so you have to pay the fine. Which one would you prefer? Now, again, the economist would say, well, of course you'd prefer the first one. That's how you get your money back, and that was your objective. But lots of people prefer the second one. Why? Because their objective wasn't just to get the money. Their objective was to right a wrong, and they didn't get to right a wrong. Uh, they just got their money back because of an administrative uh, duty, but they didn't get to say this was not fair. Um, I could go on and on, and I'm not going to because I want to get to some, some other issues in the next uh, uh, five minutes. Okay, here's another one. Many times an incentive plan will look like this. And it's so here's the, here's the compensation. These are for salespeople who often have big uh, sales incentives. And here's the total quarterly sales. And notice that the pay 
for performance is really, really sort of uh, sloped upwards. You almost don't see just how, how strong this pay for performance is, but it starts out, uh, the commission is 0% up to a point and 0%. And almost everybody is just a small round, uh, is, is around here. But yet you have these strong accelerators way, way out here. Well, one of the reasons why companies do this when you dig in, and there's evidence for this that I could, get, uh, I could talk about the, the scientific study, the way in which my colleague Ian Larkin, uh, who I actually taught with, but who's now uh, at UCLA, a tenured professor there, very good, uh, found that this is because of overconfidence. Even though m most everybody is down here, it turns out that these, these way out uh, uh, in incentives are highly motivational because at least at the beginning of the year, people think they're riding this way up there. And the overconfidence is, is just striking. Like people routinely, even year after year after year, not getting out there, believe that they're gonna be out there. So it, it's motivational. It makes me cringe a little bit because you're sort of taking advantages of, 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 a, of a bias, but it does create good uh, motivation. Okay, here's a weird one. Um, and some of these are going to be just the economics and some of them I'm going to introduce a behavioral concept. Uh, there was a, one sales incentive uh, that I saw from talking to a company. I'm not going to give you the company name because I'm not sure they're proud of this. But what they did was that they had, uh, they would give a hunting rifle to the top sellers. Why would anybody give a hunting rifle as a prize for winning the, the top incentives. We know the prizes actually work really well from other evidence, but why a hunting rifle? Well, it turns out that in the South, these were almost all men in this uh, company and the sales force, they really liked to go hunting. And their wives, because uh, they were almost all men, didn't want them to, uh, their, their wives wanted the money. But the company figured out that they would be they would really value the hunting rifle because they're the ones who are actually doing the, the sales. And then they could come home and say, honey, look, I won this, uh, this, this rifle. Here's my bonus and here's the rifle. And they, and they get their rifle. That one I'm really, really squeamish about and, and don't even think should be done, but it's just sort of an example of, you know, clever in, in this way, almost slightly evil uh, ways of, 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 of using incentives. Okay, next one. Horseman Little bought Gulfstream in 1990. Here is the big problem that they were facing. The sales force was having trouble closing deals since it required making a sale to very wealthy and influential people, right? These are typically billionaires who buy an $80 million plane. Um, so Teddy Forsman, who I wrote a case on and, and described this to me, uh, got together with his board. His board had like former Secretary of State George Schultz, uh, Walter Mondale, for, former Vice President, a, a bunch of like very high profile people. Well, when you're selling Gulfstream jets, having low level sales, salespeople call up uh, very uh, high level people doesn't work so well. Um, but if George Schultz makes a call, all of a sudden they take the call and now you could get the salesperson involved to try to close the deal. But how do you motivate the, the, the board? Well, they already had stock. That's one way to do it. So what they did was very clever. They gave them a little airplane for every time they helped close a deal, Secretary, uh, the Secretary George Schultz would at the next board meeting, uh, for every deal that he closed, he would get a little, uh, a little uh, Gulfstream airplane, like a model that he could put in front of them. Well, they all started competing to see who could have the most uh, airplanes in front of them. And it turns out that with very little money whatsoever, they got great, great uh, uh, strong incentives on the board supporting the, 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 the sales force. Okay, let me, let me, let me move on to uh, other examples. So here's just a quick example by my colleague Ian Larkin, again, showing that non-monetary prizes People will, will people value them a lot. And in, in my view, the behavioral science suggests that we way underutilize these things because they're often far cheaper prizes, uh, you know, trips, uh, you know, stickers, uh, 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 
uh, uh, plaques that go on the wall for employee of the month or for the top gun seller, et, et cetera. These things are very valuable and they, and, they, and they don't cost money. One of the problems with using money is money costs money. And so there are other ways of getting pretty strong incentives, especially among sales forces, but not only uh, without having to use money. It also feels far more meaningful. Okay, here's a famous study about uh, daycare done by my co-author, Uri Ganesi. Um, and so what they did is they, there were 10 private daycare centers in Israel. Uh, Uri is uh, Israeli, so he did it with one of his Israeli colleagues. And the problem that they were trying to solve is that parents would pick up their children late. And so they said, okay, let's just do the, the, the standard normal thing. Let's just introduce a fine for late coming parents. Uri and Rust Rustashini uh, talked them into doing it randomly so that some of the centers uh, got the fine and other, ones, and other ones didn't. What happened? Well, you'd think, of course, that lateness would go down. Instead, it went up. Well, why? The reason is, is that there was already a social incentive about picking your kids up late. I know, I've been there. You go to pick up your kids at daycare, but you're on a business call or on a call with uh, one of your colleagues about a paper or something like that. You're late. You're getting worried that your kids are waiting and the, and the daycare workers who are working with them are, are, are waiting and you feel lots of pressure to get there on time. But now all of a sudden they come along with a fine and they say, you know what? It's like 15 bucks for every 15 minutes, a dollar a minute. And you look at this and say, you know what? This is important enough uh, that I'm going to just spend, you know, 30 minutes sitting here on this call. I know it's a dollar a minute, but, uh, but, but, but it's worth it to me. And so what you've done, if you think about it, is you've replaced an incentive system that's more of a social incentive system, but a very important one, and you've monetized it. And so now it crowds out the old incentive system. So that's one thing that, that designers have to think very carefully about whenever you're putting in an incentive system is, is there something that's already there that can be crowded out? And the answer is sometimes yes. Having said that, um, there are also times when incentives can lead to crowding in. Uri Ganesi, once again, uh, he's a very good uh, uh, researcher. They basically paid college students to go to the gym, increase uh, gym attendance, and then they took it all away. And they said, okay, what happens afterwards? Normally you think, okay, well now once you take the money away, people think, oh, well, the reason I was exercising is because of the money. And so now that you take it away, I'm just gonna exercise less. No, they exercised more. Why? Because an incent that incentive system wasn't crowding out anything. In fact, it was helping people go to the gym. Once they got to the gym, once they developed the habit, then all of a sudden, once they took the money away, it's like, no, this is good for me. No, I can do this. No, I've gotten into the routine and gym, gym attendance uh, stayed high. So um, there, there are lots of ways in which behavior on science influences the way we think about incentives. Incentives can backfire. They, uh, sometimes they can uh, 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 lead to behaviors that you're not expecting because of that. Uh, I'll give you an, a, a, another example that's related to people's identity. Uh, Joe Torrey, uh, from, from earlier slides that you'll see, I'll, I'll, everyone will get the slides when you're done. Joe Torrey, the manager of the Yankees, won the World Series a whole bunch of times uh, with the Yankees and then didn't win for about four or five years. The Steinbrenners who owned the Yankees went to him and said, you know what, instead of giving you a $8 million salary, we want to, uh, or a $7 million salary, excuse me, we want to give you a $5 million salary but $3 million if you win the World Series. Sounds like a win-win, right? You can actually make more money contingent on winning the World Series. Um, he was so insulted that he quit. He said, it's not about the money. You think I'm gonna work harder in order to, uh, uh, in, in order to win a World Series? In this case, the framing of the incentive for him was, this is an insult. This is saying that I actually need to be motivated by money to do something that I deeply, deeply care about. I don't like what that says about me, and I don't like uh, what it says about me to me, and I don't like what it says about me to others. And so he left for half the money and went to the Dodgers. Uh, and things like that happen all the time. 
again, that was replacing an incentive system that already existed, which is the pride of winning the World Series. Um, I'm going to now jump to, actually, I'm going to stop here because I have stuff on why using money to motivate innovation is very, very hard and that you actually need to do other things. Um, and I also have stuff on why fear uh, can be a very poor incentive system. But I don't think we have time to do that and for me to answer your questions. So I'm going to stop there. If somebody wants to talk about it, I'm happy to do that. But otherwise, I do want to stop and open it up for questions. So thank you all. Uh, that's the end of my formal talk. I'm happy to answer as many questions as you would like. Thank you, Brian. Uh, this, this was really interesting. Uh, I'm getting a lot of positive feedback from people. Uh, and I myself thought uh, it was super useful. I'm going to start it off with a question that I have for you. Uh, then just move on to the questions. Uh, everyone feel free to uh, add questions in the Q&A or just um, raise your hand and we can even activate your video and you can ask the question live. So the first question for me is, is there any evidence on what are the key elements to design an effective incentive strategy? That you Say can that again. On? What are the key yeah, elements? Are there some key elements uh, to design an effective incentive strategy? Yes. Um, um, there, there are lots of key elements. Can you pull, uh, pull up? To, so, so I didn't want to do this because I thought that the talk should really be about some of the cool behavioral science that goes into it. Yep. But yes, actually, when you, uh, uh, when you design an incentive plan, so by the time you get to the end of my book, it's like, okay, here's a checklist. We, you know, we, we go through and we talk through all the concepts. But then in the end, it's like, okay, now we've taught you how to be a cook show me, you know, the recipe, <laughs> you know, what's, what, what's the how to. So the, the key elements of an incentive plan answer the following questions. Um, who should make the decisions? Uh, what are the key behaviors that we're trying to get them to do? Two is where are we in the the, the, the trade-off funnel? The, and, you know, there's a, there's a trade-off there. Three is should we use subjective uh, uh, elements uh, in, a, in an incentive plan? And there you have the obvious benefits from what I talked about earlier, which is that you don't have that stark trade-off. Once you introduce some subjectivity, some qualitative measures, you can measure teamwork uh, at the end of it. You could uh, ask whether or not an individual is actually good at, at, at teamwork. And so you can actually uh, get that in there. The, the bad thing about it is, is if you don't have much trust built in the organization, and then you go in and you add this like discretionary incentive plan, you can destroy your whole organization. So for example, this one company that I, uh, I was actually acting CEO of the company for, uh, uh, for a while uh, in the Middle East. When I first started, I put in a completely objective plan just based on profits. Why? Nobody trusted anybody about anything. If we had tried to put in a subjective plan, I think the whole thing would have fallen apart. Today, the plan is like two thirds subjective, one third objective, because 15 years of really building up trust and helping people understand it. Now, I think the same organization that would have, that would have revolted had we put in a subjective incentive plan now would revolt if you tried to take it away because they think it's good management. Uh, then you want to broadly measure rewards. That's another element. You don't just want to think about money, but you want to think about all the other stuff that, that, that people value. And uh, as I mentioned, I think the non-monetary is way, way underused uh, because the non-monetary benefits are often cheaper and more meaningful, and they can be really targeted towards your, towards your group. Um, you want to think hard about whether or not you're crowding out or crowding in uh, incentives as I, as I, uh, uh, mentioned, and you don't want to crowd out and you do want to crowd in. Um, and that's a, sort of a case by case basis. Um, and then you want to think hard about the shape of the, of, of the incentive. As I, as I mentioned, sometimes you want to, uh, uh, you know, so pay for performance. I, I tell my students and saying the book is a meaningless phrase. What, what, what pay or what are you giving for what, for what performance you want to measure something called fragility. Uh, is the pay plan, uh, you know, fragile or does it pay out under a wide uh, variety of circumstances? This is where uh, I always say machismo doesn't get you, doesn't get you there because lots of people try to say, 
oh, we put in a really tough plan. Nobody gets anything unless you get to like you, the way out performance and it sounds really cool and, and macho. And then you realize, well, you just set your whole organization up for failure. When you get to month eight out of the year, uh, you're gonna come back to me and say, oh, let's redo the plan. And sure enough, every time I fail to convince a company of that, then I'm designing a plan, they come back to me in the eighth month and I have to bite my tongue not to say I told you so. And by the way, sometimes I don't bite my tongue. Um, and there's, there's some other things, but, uh, but, but I think I've answered the question enough. I'm going to give other uh, questions, but uh, uh, by the book. So. Uh, <laughs> um, Thank you. All right. I'm going to ask uh, Karen to uh, talk. She, she's raised her hand. So Karen, uh, you have permission to talk if you'd like to ask a question. Hi, Karen. Oh, uh, I'm going to mute you as well. Are you, uh, Karen, I think you're muted. At least on my screen, I see the name Karen and a mute button. All right. I, I will give uh, permission to Matt Johnson for now. And Karen, let us know when you're ready. All right. Matt, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Great. Hi, Matt. Hi, Brian. How are you? This was great. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, the, the question I wanted to ask around this, and and, uh, and I'm love everything you're talking about here, but with, with intrinsic motivation, uh, yep. not to taking, not just, no, I mean, you have the self-determination theory and other motivation theories, but just intrinsic motivation in general. Yep. How, how have you used that or how have you seen uh, other, say, researchers or practitioners utilize intrinsic motivation in order to inform the best or most effective, you know, extrinsic or incentive design that, as you've talked about today? Yeah. Have you had much experience uh, looking at that, how you craft the, you know, so kind of taking a dual synergistic approach, of looking at what's important inherently, whether that's, again, collaboration, autonomy, professional development, appreciation, you know, influence, the things of that nature that are more of that inherent uh, nature, and then looking at measuring that to see what would be the most effective based on that, or even the, maybe not even the rewards themselves, but the, the mechanism or the medium for driving those for communications or group type of rewards, yeah. things like that. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop, I'll stop. I'll let you answer. Thank no, you. Great, great, great question, Matt. Um, so let's start with this, with this diagram here that has sort of motivation. It's a little bit like Maslow, you know, if you know the Maslow hierarchy, you know, there's like basic stuff down here, like breathing, food, security, housing, and then you sort of move up. And when you get to the, when you get to the top of the funnel, right, intrinsic, it's like, I'm doing this because this is like existentially awesome. Like we're learning about the truth about humanity. Oh, that's one of the reasons why I love being a professor, right, is we get to think about this stuff and, uh, and, and it's cool. And a lot of it I just, I just love to do. Having said that, I've never seen any job where it's all intrinsic motivation. In other words, you know, even football players don't always like practice and working out. I certainly don't like grading. Uh, I don't like getting stuck with a hard problem when Davis and I are working on uh, empirical results and we get funny, right? Every job has sort of stuff where, you know, no, you have to be motivated by other stuff. But in a company, you should recognize that, you know, this is where economists were, right? It's all pay for performance and like everybody works for something else. And, and what you're saying, Matt, is no, some of it is for the joy of it. So I think you try to create the conditions uh, for that. Uh, so for example, have, you know, having people bonding with each other at work and actually having, you know, setting up systems and ways for people to get together and know each other. That's awesome for, for generating motivation. Uh, showing them the ways that work is more meaning, me, uh, meaningful. For example, uh, one of my colleagues, Ryan Buell, has very good uh, 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 behavioral science on the fact that when the customer can actually see the, um, the uh, I'm sorry, when the, yeah, when the customer can see the employee doing the work, they appreciate it more, value it more. And likewise, when the employee can see the customer enjoying the product, uh, and it could be anything from like a sandwich to something that's been built, um, they actually uh, are more motivated as well. So you sort of get a win-win 
uh, by making it more, more meaningful. And I think lots and lots of stuff can and should be done to make work meaningful. Uh, there's also lots of evidence that when you just have money as a prime in the organization and everybody thinks about our job is to transact in this way to make more money, uh, yeah, you'll get, you'll get motivation typically from the extrinsic. And in, and in fact, over time, you might get only people who are very, very highly motivated by extrinsic motivation, but it's probably not going to be a great company because you're really handicapping yourself by not looking at sort of the whole person and the whole bit of, of, of motivation. That's why Gallup and all these other organizations that help uh, companies uh, drive uh, employee engagement, uh, I think they're, they're, they're doing an incredibly important service. So that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but uh, yes, there's, there's lots of stuff that you can do. Here, here's another cool idea. Mike, Mike Norton, uh, one of my colleagues at HBS has this one. And that is, uh, and this sort of goes to bond and mean, meaning, is that you give people a budget for a bonus that they can spend on somebody else. So that it could be anything from like actual like coupons for, for typically to buy something. And if I catch Davis doing something off, uh, awesome. I'm like, Davis, here's a $25 uh, uh, gift certificate for being so awesome to what, whatever it is. Um, that's the way that sort of engages people. It's sort of unusual. Uh, it connects people. People feel like they're part of it. You know, I think uh, ideas like that are, are dramatically uh, under, uh, uh, underused. Let me just say one final thing on this. My next project when I'm done with this book is to think about how to make, uh, how to use artificial intelligence to make work more meaningful. Because if you, if it were, I've, I've written a case on, uh, uh, that, that Davis uh, co-authored on the China social credit system, where they're basically trying to use uh, sort of rewards and punishments to make people be trustworthy and, 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 and behave. And they're using lots of artificial intelligence to, measure when people come to work, how long they take bathroom breaks, et cetera, et cetera. My fear with artificial intelligence is, is it's going to start to look, A, like a police force, and B, as a way to cut costs, to substitute for labor. But there's a third thing that could be awesome, which is using, using artificial intelligence to actually cut out the parts of the work that are not so meaningful, like the equivalent of, for me, grading. I don't like grading exams. I maybe if I have a hundred students, I maybe like grading the first 10, but by the time I get to exam 95, that's just not a very fun job, I'll, I'll, I'll admit. Um, but to basically find ways of using this new technology, not to just cut costs, but instead to make the work more enjoyable, more meaningful. And that won't be anybody's instinct, but it's certainly, it should be. Um, and, uh, I'm actually very excited about that. And if anybody here on this call uh, has stuff that they've written or know about on that, by all means, send it to me. Uh, but I've, al I've already connected up with our AI folks, uh, Kareem Lakani and uh, Marco Iancidi at, at HBS. All right. So right. I, we have five, I, we have six or seven minutes left. So I'm yeah, happy to take any questions. Perfect. All right. I'm going to uh, ask a couple of questions of, from the Q&A and then I'm going to ask Trudy Schaffer to uh, uh, ask her question. Uh, and I see another question. Yeah, feel free to raise your hands, guys, uh, if we can keep it short so we can get to more questions. Uh, one question that Patrice uh, Marzanis has is, can you offer different incentives, incentives to different employees? I guess if they are doing the same, the same job. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? You have to be careful about that because you just you, you said the crucial, crucial words, Elke, which is for the same job, right? So all of a sudden it becomes what you get becomes a reference point for me. And if, uh, you know, and if we give something for you, that's the, that I value more and I don't get that, then it, then it could start creating a sense of, unf uh, of unfairness. One way to do it is that you have a set of prizes uh, and you sort of earn coupons towards those prizes. I've seen that done uh, uh, productively. Um, I also think, uh, you know, for contests, that's a great way to like have stuff that's, that's very meaningful that people are trying to get. And when you figure out what the prizes are, it's a good idea to actually know your, know your people. That's why I use the hunting example, because I think it's a 
marvelous example of knowing your people and what they value. It just happens to have a sort of a creepy undertone. But but the but the logic of doing that, if it weren't so creepy, I I, I can tell you if if uh, if if I came home with a hunting rifle that I won from a from a sales contest, um, my wife would very quickly say, "You are not killing anything with that gun. We are going to go on eBay and sell it and give the money to charity." So you know that wouldn't have worked so well. But 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 the logic of that is 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 quite good. Let me. Um, let me actually just show one other thing on fear because fear is uh, uh, it, it, fear is is a, is a big motivator. There's just no getting around the fact that fear is sort of like the drive to defend it. People are afraid of what they lose, and you know we've got cases on uh, things. This one guy, the last thing I want is a comfortable employee. I want to make everyone uncomfortable. Then we know these you know well-known people, Jeff Bezos. Uh, Indra Noye, CEO of Pepsi, Steve Ballmer, they're all known as like the fear. That doesn't mean that that's the right way to manage. That means that they managed to do it successfully, but that doesn't mean that that's the best thing for their organization. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's driving some type of behavior and they could actually be doing a lot better. That, that would be my, my view. Because what happens is we often think about, uh, so, so, so think about these two axes. You know, how much performance do you get from, from effort, given that you sort of put more stress, more arousal on people? And in general, it goes up, right? As you sort of add, let me just move that around, which I didn't try to do. But as you add, uh, you know, as you add sort of stress and arousal to it, and some fear gets involved, okay, people are going to perform better. But stress has, and, uh, has all kinds of bad effects. And for very complex tasks, it sometimes gets in the way because now you suddenly you've got lots of, of stress. People can't think as well. They don't think as create creativity as creatively. And so sometimes the, 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 it actually backfires and you get on the backside of, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the curve. And this is called the Yerkes Dotson uh, law. Now what's, what's the response to that? Well, companies need to be very careful about just using fear and just laying on super high powered incentives for things that create creativity, like innovation, for example. But here's one of my favorite uh, graphs, and I just wanted to sneak it in there because uh, we hired somebody named Allison Woodbrooks for this brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, piece of behavioral science that has actually changed my life quite a bit. Um, and that is almost, so, so think about uh, two axes. One is negative valence, positive valence, sort of happy versus uh, sad. And the other one is high energy versus low energy. So you could be high energy negative. That's like in an extreme case, you get angry. Or, but let's just think about the cases where you're just feeling performance anxiety. What do you do with that? The recommendation that we always have is to go and be calm. Just calm down, right? Uh, isn't there even like a poster on that? Be calm and uh, carry on. Yeah, be calm and carry on. Um, and what Alison Brooks says is, you know what? She's done st uh, studies on this. It's very hard to go from this quadrant to this quadrant. Why? Because you have to change both your energy level, lower, which is really hard to do, and you have to change the valence. You have to go from negative to positive. What you can do is get excited. And that's what I did to get ready for this talk. Believe it or not, after all these years, when I'm giving a talk, I still get a little bit of performance anxiety. I want to do well. And I used to try to just calm myself down. I don't do that anymore. I get excited. This is awesome. I get to talk to some brilliant, interesting people from the Kennedy School. Uh, I actually spent a year at the Kennedy School. They're going to have good questions. Maybe somebody will, will uh, get excited and read the book. So I try to get excited. And that is actionable for just about everybody on the planet because I don't know anybody who doesn't feel performance, ang performance anxiety. And you just try to turn it from, you keep the high energy and just try to turn it into a positive thing. So I'm willing to do one last question if, you, uh, if, if, if you'd like, but maybe the time is up. Yeah, let's know. Let's have one more question. Uh, Trudy, uh, I'm going to uh, allow you to talk. I, I saw your question. I think it's interesting. Just if you, we can keep it short, you're ready. To I'll keep talk. a short answer. Okay. Sure. Professor Hall, thank you for uh, uh, presenting this information. It's very interesting. I work on a nonprofit board. It's um, 
of us serve gratis and all of the committee work is done by volunteers. Okay. And I'm hoping that you can give us or give me some ideas on um, incentives that we can use to improve performance because we have a bad case of volunteer mindset. Poor performance is perceived as acceptable because people are just volunteering. So how do we overcome that mindset and incentivize people to actually work on, on topics that you would consider them to be intrinsically motivated by, but they don't perform? Is there some way of measuring uh, performance? In other words, you have some sense that, I don't know if people are sort of aren't showing up as often as you'd like, or when they get there, they sort of, uh, you know, don't, don't work very hard or don't work very efficiently. Uh, but there's some reason why they're volunteering, right? Yeah, precisely. It's an organization that people are very passionate about. Yeah. And uh, when we have an annual conference, everyone gets very motivated. They're on a dopamine high. They want to do something. They go home, they volunteer for a committee, and then either they don't show up for meetings or they do, but they don't follow through on the tasks that they've been assigned. Yeah, you use the word committee, and committees are almost always... Uh, soul destroying in my experience. Uh, but I understand maybe committees are necessary in order for you to do the work. Um, yeah, I guess I would just think of, of ways in which you can uh, measure progress. And, you know, because uh, uh, Bob Kaplan wrote in the balanced scorecard, what you measure is what you get. That's the very first line of the very first uh, uh, HBR article on uh, 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 on the balanced scorecard, which is one of the most widely used sort of way of measuring performance in, in any organization. And I, I would encourage you to, to study it because it, it applies to any organization. And it's not, the whole point is that it's not just about the financial part. It's also about the processes, the how, how do the customers feel, in this case, how would whoever you're trying to help, how are they being benefited, et cetera. But I would, I would try to work in ways in which you would measure and note that. And because if that's what people want to do, uh, they actually are very passionate about this, showing them the ways in which their actions lead. I, in other words, I wouldn't use money. I wouldn't try to put on monetary incentives uh, because I think you're, that's not why they're there to make money. They're volunteering. And so, but what you have to appeal to is, right, they care, right? They're sort of in this place. They care about the meaning of the work, or maybe they, the interjected motivation is about a feeling that you get pride in, 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 in something or alleviating guilt because, uh, you know, people are hungry, so I'm going to volunteer for a, for a hunger uh, uh, organization because I just feel so guilty about that. At least I get to do something, right? So, there's some emotions that are going on. They're probably bonding with each other. They probably like that. There's, there's some meaning to it. I would find ways of digging in, talking about these things, trying to measure them, using surveys to talk about how you can do it better. But those are the things that, that you have in your, in your uh, arsenal. They're, they're harder to use, right? I mean, a bonus plan is the easiest thing in the world to do, right? You just need a, once you have a measure, you just like let it rip, more money, uh, for more performance, but um, I wouldn't do that here. I would I would try to focus on measuring these softer things, talking about them, and connecting them to people's actions and enthusiasm. All right. Why don't I? I don't know Thank if that's you. a good answer. I'd be happy to follow up by by email, Trudy, because it's a cool question, and I have no idea what organization it is. But I, um, I'm I'm happy for you that you found an organization that you're passionate about. Thank you. So with that, I will stop. Uh, I thank you all for working in the public sector. Uh, I'm a Kennedy School dropout and I spent one year in government and I found it just so, so hard. I came away thinking, I'm so glad there are people out there that can do this for a living, but I, I, just, I just can't. If I have to analyze, and yet one, I was on the Council of Economic Advisors way back. I thought if I have to analyze one more plan by some senator just because, uh, you know, it's, it's in their district and they want sugar prices to be lower or whatever it was. 
uh, it just, it was just destroying my soul. Uh, but for many people, it's, they love it. There's a passion about it. They're making the world a better place. And, and you all are doing that. And I know that. And I'm just sorry that I'm not joining you. I do vote and I care and I'm supporting you and I will even help educate. But, but, but uh, I did drop out. So, all right. Well, thank you all. Really, really enjoyed this. Uh, lots of intrinsic excitement for me. Hope that you enjoyed it uh, too. And uh, please send me an email or examples or what about, what about, what about, or you were totally wrong about this. I'm, I'm totally uh, willing to entertain uh, lots of pushback. So thank you very much. And I'm going to clap for you all. So thank, thanks for the good questions. Thank you so much, Brian. I'm going to um, share with everyone the slides afterwards. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to share the recording as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and there are some more questions that we didn't get to. And uh, I'm, I'm going to send them to you if, if you can answer those as well. And I can share them with, uh, with the group. Yeah. So, if there's enough enthusiasm, I'm willing, you know, several weeks down the road to try to, try to you know, do it again. But yep. uh, All right. Perfect. Let, 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 let's see what it looks like. Because I, I, I genuinely do enjoy this and I learn it and I'm writing a book on it and teaching it. So there's, there's just a million examples that we didn't get to in studies and so I'm happy to talk more. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. I want to thank Rachel Quinzel from, from, the, from the Alumni Relations for helping us with everything. Uh, thank you from the Kennedy School uh, Alumni Association Board and uh, all the Harvard clubs that are joining us and the, all the friends uh, of, uh, of the clubs and the, and the associations. Brian, thanks so much. Uh, and we will have the next talk with uh, Ashley Willans, I'm going to send uh, oh, I'm uh, teaching, the new work. With I'm teaching with Ashley. So uh, uh, she has, she focuses mostly on the non-monetary uh, stuff and also money and time trade-offs. And she'll, she's, she's going to be awesome. So you, you, she, you she was wanna... predicting the same for you as well. So this is <laughs> Brian, Brian Hall is in our game as well. Alison Woods Brooks is also in our game. So just uh, be on the lookout for the, the game of life hacks as well that's going to come out you'll see uh, small uh, tips for, from all of those good uh, researchers. Thanks Can everyone. I one, could I do one last thing? Of course. I, I'm not sure, but I think my mom and dad uh, joined, <laughs> uh, joined and I haven't physically seen them other than uh, on FaceTime or Zoom uh, for a long time because of the pandemic. But mom and dad, if you're listening, I love you <laughs> and thanks for joining. So, Thank you everyone. Thank nice you mom and dad. Uh, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Hall. Wonderful okay. people. Perfect. Um, All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right. We'll see you Thanks. soon. Bye-bye.